The Churches of Christ presents Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. I'm James Johnston, the minister of the Fourth and Fine Church of Christ in Corning, Arkansas. We're glad that you joined us. The program is brought to you by the Area Churches of Christ that are listed at the end of the program. Please visit or contact them if you have a Bible question. Our lesson today is entitled, God's Solution for Our Struggles, Salvation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, it says, for as the body is one, it has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So, when we are baptized into Christ's death, we are made part of the body, which is the church. There was a lady that, her husband had become the president of a bank in a big city, and it was back in the olden days, and, and she wanted to go to Europe to buy some material for her curtains. And her husband said they could. That day, you had to go on boat. There wasn't planes and stuff like that. Uh, and so she went by boat. She got to England, and she found this Gobelin tapestry. And in U.S. dollars, it was $1,000 for that material. And so she sent a telegram to her husband, and her husband uh, got the telegram. It said it was $1,000, and he called the telegraph office and said, you send her a message. And he says, no, the price is too high. Well, whenever the telegraph office got the message to her, and she went ahead and bought it. And she came home and, and she showed him the beautiful, beautiful material and it was over a thousand dollars and he was looking at her, I, I, t I thought I told you not to buy it. And she pulled out the telegraph and this is what it said, no price too high. And so they had taken what he, he said and shortened it to no price too high thinking that any amount that she would spend would be right. Well, he accepted her, he loved her, and they went on and, and made do. But you got to think about our salvation, no price too high. I think that that's the, what we can say about it because Jesus gave his life on the cross. He died on the cross for our sins. In Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, it says, 
And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So he was basically saying, go teach, baptize. He's called it make disciples. And then teach them again the things that I've taught them. He says the same sort of thing and as recorded in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And here's what he says there. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So in those two verses, he says you've got to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. And he said both of them are important. And so we find our setting uh, here talking about the day of Pentecost. And baptism in the, in the preaching of Peter began on the day of Pentecost as we find recorded in Acts 2 beginning in verse 22. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by a determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hand and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, it says they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men what, and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we know that the, he said more words to them. Here's what he said, continuing in verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children, that's generations to come, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day 3,000 souls were added to them. Now that's amazing. The first sermon on the day of Pentecost, the people heard, they repented, they were baptized into Christ. Their sins were washed away, and we find the beginning of the church. And so we symbolize the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism as we are buried under the water and raised to walk in newness of life. That's the resurrection. And it's always an immersion in the Bible. In Acts 2 and 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Who did the adding to the church? The Lord did. He was writing their names in the book of life. We find that in the book of Revelations. But he says there, the Lord is the one who adds people to the church. Number two, baptism at the teaching of Philip. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 26, it says, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go to the south along the roads which is down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. So he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, and a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake his, this chariot. And it's kind of interesting. He has a scroll, and it's the book of Isaiah. So Philip ran and 
heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice, his justice was taken away, and who declared it to his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip, I ask you of whom is the prophet speaking? And he says, of himself or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. So he pointed the way to Christ. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And so they're going to go down into the water and be baptized. Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. So what we've learned so far is on Pentecost, they heard Peter present the gospel about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says they believed, they were cut to the heart, they repented, and they were baptized for the remission of sin. In the Ethiopian eunuch, we find he heard Philip explain the scriptures, and, and Philip taught him the gospel, uh, the good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then we find the Ethiopian confessed Christ, and then he was baptized. It says they went down into the water, and he was baptized. It's interesting, the rest of the story is Philip just vanishes away. And the Ethiopian eunuch goes on his way rejoicing. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So there's one baptism in the Bible into Jesus Christ. And that one baptism is by immersion. And it symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 8, it says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That washing of regeneration is baptism. Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Then having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Being become an heir of eternal life is a great blessing from God. In verse 8 it says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So in being baptized, we are not the one working, but rather it is the Lord who is working when we submit to the obedience of faith in baptism. He is the one washing away our sins. He is the one redeeming us. He is the one who justifies us because of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Number four, he is the one granting forgiveness of sins. And number five, he is the one giving us the new birth, that is, the recreating us so that we can walk in newness of life. Number six, he is providing union with Christ, which is part of the kingdom, which is part of the church. And number seven, he is giving one, he is the one giving this Holy Spirit as a gift to us. If you're not ready to leave this life without Jesus, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Would you like to obey his will? I hope so. If so, you need to contact one of the churches at the end of the program and Talk to someone about baptism. 
Now let's look at the conversion of Saul who became Paul. Saul was a persecutor of the Christians in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 9, Saul's journey begins to Damascus to persecute the church there. And it says there in Acts 9, beginning in verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone from heaven, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And for three days, without sight, and neither he neither ate nor drank, now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. He asked an honest question. And here he has authority from chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. He says he was a chosen vessel that God had chosen. In verse 17 of chapter 9, it says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once and arose and was baptized. When Paul recounts this later on in Acts chapter 2, he tells the whole story again. But he puts the words of Ananias in a different form and in a different fashion. Here's what he says Ananias says to him. He says, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So we see in this that Saul had been praying, he had been fasting, but his sins were still with him until he had the sins washed away in the waters of baptism. So Saul's conversion, he, he prayed and fasted, but his sins were not washed away until he was baptized. We too must be baptized in order for our sins to be washed away. And I pray if you need to be baptized, you will take care of that in, in a very soon amount of time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God over all. And it's saying here we're all in one Spirit. We're baptized into one body, whether, which is the body of Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, and verse 27, it says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The idea of putting on Christ is similar to putting on a garment. You see, you were in your sin. You were without Christ. But when you were baptized, you put on Christ. Symbolically, in ancient times, people used to take off the clothes that they were baptized on and put on new white robes to symbolize the purity that they had now with Christ because Christ had washed away all their sins. But we have a change in our life, a dedication in our life to serve the Lord. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a very important event in the Bible. And because he was raised, we know we too can be raised as well. 
We need to be obedient to Christ. It says we needed to be buried with him in baptism so that we can be raised with him. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and 21, it's talking about Noah in the days of Noah. It says there were eight souls that were saved on the ark. And that's not very many. Think of all the people that in the world that were washed away in the waters of the flood. But Noah was spared in the boat, the Noah's ark. And it says here, there is an antitype which saves us, and it's baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was raised, and he says baptism now saves us. We thank you for listening to us today, and I want to reiterate a few more points about some of the things that we have said but it is important that you understand that God has a plan for us and God wants us to be his children walking in the paths of righteousness and living for him in the things that he has said. We find in Romans chapter 6, just a second here, let me find it. We find there are many passages in the Bible, but Romans chapter 6, if you read through that, it talks about baptism and it talks about how we died with Christ and how we live with him and how we're raised with him. The day of Pentecost was a, a mighty day to call people to come to Christ and, and thinking about what Jesus had done with him. Let's go back to the words of Mark chapter 16 verses 15 and 16 and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. We need to realize that there is something that we need to do in order to be right with God, and that includes both repentance and baptism. You know, Jesus spoke many words on earth, but probably the Great Commission is the one that he has the most importance for us today. And he came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He had all authority in heaven. He's been given all authority on earth. He is now with God. It's interesting because he was part of creation. If the book of John starts off, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It says, In Christ, nothing was made that has been made. So going on in Matthew 28 and verse 19, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he wanted his gospel to go out to everyone in every nation so that they might understand that it is important for them to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in order to have their sins forgiven and then he says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, we go and teach and baptize, but if we stop there, we've not done all that God has wanted us to do. It says, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. There are more things to learn about the church. There are more things to learn about serving Christ. And to teach them to read their Bible, to teach them to grow in the faith, is part of our mission and part of our goal. And so we do that. I know a man that he had this little coin. He carried with him everywhere that he went. And on that little coin, Coin, it says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He carried that coin with me. He showed that coin to me. He said whenever he went somewhere, he showed it to all the people that he could. That was his way of getting a door to share the gospel because he says, the Lord is going to be with me always, even to the very last minute I'm alive. The Lord is with me. He thought that coin was very important because it reminded me of him of the promises that God had given him. I think it's important that you and I realize the seriousness of this and to take it to heart and to put it into practice 
so that we might grow closer to God and do His will. We know the Lord adds those to the church who belong to Him and according to His purpose, that they live right with Him. And so, as we think about these things, we know that it was important in all these cases that they went through and they first believed, then they repented, and then they confessed, and then they were baptized into Christ. In Titus 3, 4 through 8, it says, But when the kindness and love of God appeared, uh, of God, when the kindness and love of God towards men appeared, that was Jesus Christ coming to earth to dwell here as a man, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus did for us. He died on the cross for our sins. He gave his life on the cross for our sin. He was what extended mercy to us, not that we would ever deserve salvation, but that he gave it freely so that we could have everlasting life. In verse 6 it says, whom he poured out abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, that we should become heirs of the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want to affirm constantly, that those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. It is a wonderful thing to live for God. It is a wonderful thing to affirm constantly that we believe in God. It is something that we ought to share and be willing to share the gospel with others. Today, I tried to do that. I hope you understand. Thank you very much for listening. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online at nettletonchurchofchrist.org.